Good evening. Um, I'm Jeff Conibear and Chairman of the Mid Hearts Bonsai. Um, if I tell you, I got into um, bonsai when I worked in the Far East, mainly in South Korea, but Japan and Singapore and Thailand. And when I came back, I joined Mid Hearts Bonsai Club and been there ever since. Now, so my background is a toxicologist and I was retired from the UN when I was 55 and I took up teaching physiology, both plant and animal physiology. And I did that till I retired eight years ago. So that's my background. Um, if I start talking science and people don't understand, for goodness sake, let me know, because it's much easier to explain it as I go along. Anyway, before we go any further, we need to do some chemistry, because without understanding chemistry, what I'm going to talk about is a waste of time. Now, this is a periodic table, and I used to set homework for my students, and it was to learn the first 80 elements and their symbols. I'm only going to ask you to look at a couple tonight. The first thing is... To, to look at is that the periodic table is laid out in groups and it's laid across this way in periods. And that accounts for a number of orbits that the electrons spin round. Down the columns are the groups and you will notice it clicks through. So one has got one electron in the outside, two has got two electrons, there's hydrogen, group one, one electron. Helium, group two, two electrons. And it goes through three, four. Now this column here, all have got one electron in its outer shell, which makes them quite unstable. All the group here have got seven electrons in their outer shell. And they're unstable, so they actually want one. They all want an extra electron. So what happens with water, the hydrogen loses an electron to the oxygen, and this hydrogen loses an electron to the oxygen, so that the oxygen is now positively charged, is negatively charged because it's got two extra electrons and the hydrogen has lost its electrons so it's now positively charged. If you've got a plus and a minus they attract each other so they stick together by sharing these electrons. So hydrogen has got a very slight positive charge and the oxygen has got a very slight negative charge charge so water actually likes to stick to itself which means that if you have lots of water molecules and an iron floating around a charged particle it will surround it or as we say it dissolves it so water will dissolve negative particles and it will dissolve positive particles because of this negative positive attraction. Because of this, when you make up solutions of fertilizer or you add an organic fertilizer, the first thing that happens to the nitrogen and the hydrogen, uh, the nitrogen and the nitrates is they actually form ions. And they form these ions by losing and gaining electrons. And the common ions that we see are the nitrogen ions, which are nitrates and ammonia. And if you don't have enough of those, you get stunted growth, you get chlorosis and you can always tell because the leaves start to grow yellow. Um, the nitrogen is neg negatively charged as a salt, which means it's uh, an anion. The positive charged ions are called cations. So you, I've been to talks where people start talking about cations and anions and really haven't got a clue what they're talking about. But if you notice, there's things like phosphorus, which has got three negatives, 
potassium, which has got one positive. And you've all, over the years, added these to your soil mixes or you fertilized your trees. You now know that as soon as you add it, it has to be dissolved in water so that the tree can take it up. It's dissolved in the water and then the tree can take it up. Sulfur, usually in the form of sulfates, um, magnesium um, is a cation and calcium is another cation. The micronutrients um, are much more rare and not required quite as much. So you get manganese, iron, and copper. Anybody who adds frit to their soil or uses a garden compost will probably never ever have a deficiency of these and the other micronutrients are things like molybdenum, boron and zinc. What are trees? So if you keep that information in the back of your mind as we go through, you can actually follow what's happening. So what is a tree? Well, first of all, it's a plant. And if we follow this down, these are the kingdoms, animals, fungi, bacteria, etc. So they're plants. Trees are tracheophytes, which means they've got tubes. Means the tubes that go up and down carrying water and xylem. Unlike the bryophytes, which are the mosses and the liverworts, which use a lot of diffusion. So the simplest ones are ferns and seed bearing trees are spermatophytes, which are the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. And the angiosperms get divided into monocots and dicots. So if we look at the structure of the actual plants, we'll notice that gymnosperms only have one type of xylem. Angiosperms have two types of xylem, which if you look at a tissue structure, dicotyledon plants like nettles, cacti, and oaks are more closely related to each other than the conifers and the cycads. If you look at that in real terms, the way you treat your conifers is completely different to the way you treat the dicotyledonous trees, the broadleaf trees, you know, the, I was going to say deciduous trees, but that's not true because many gymnosperms are deciduous as well. All plants have the same cell structure in every part of the plant as a basic building block. It then adds bits extra to it or it takes bits away. So you will notice that the plant cell consists of an outside cellulose cell membrane. That's what gives it its structure. It then has cellulose cell wall and a cellular and then it has a cell membrane which allows things in and allows things out. Um, we used to say when as I was school it was semi-permeable. Um, it's not semi, it's just partially permeable. And in the middle you have an enormous vacuole full of sap. Now every cell in the plant has those. Some have got extra bits, they all have a nucleus with a nucleolus. They all have mitochondria, which is where respiration takes place. They all store starch in granules and the cells that are photosynthetic have chloroplasts, but that's usually only the green bits of the tree. Interconnecting all the cells are gaps and these gaps are called plasidomonas and it allows communications of hormones and other chemicals from one cell to the next, not the sap, just the cytoplasm, the stuff that goes round the outside. So as long as you understand that, life gets much easier. To keep a tree upright or any green plant upright, it has to be turgid. Now the turgid is produced by water in the vacuole and water goes from a low concentration of salt to a high concentration of salt. 
Under normal circumstances, the vacuole contains sugars, the outside contain ions, and it moves from the concentration here to the concentration there. If, as when I was speaking to John Trott a few months ago, he went to see one of his um, customers who had decided to go on holiday and tip fertilizer all over the trees. When they came back from holiday, two thirds of them were dead. They'd actually dehydrated. And what happens is if you put too much fertilizer on the outside, the concentration on the inside of sugars is too low and water will leave by osmosis from the inside to the outside and the whole thing will dehydrate. It can be sitting in water, but it will dehydrate. It will actually lose water from the cells and that will kill it. Isotonic just means that at the point, the tipping point when everything is equal and you know when this is happening because on a hot summer's day, although you've watered your trees quite nicely, the rate of transpiration and water loss is greater than the rate of pickup and it wilts. And so it becomes flaccid. This is not lethal in its own right unless it goes into this situation in a hypertonic solution and the whole cell becomes plasmalized. Let's have a look at structures. If you take a small section of root, you will notice under the microscope that it contains root hairs. It is the root hairs which increase the surface area of the roots and allow all the water and minerals to enter. So if we go back to the original cell we looked at, so imagine a cell, a normal cell structure just there, it has an extension. So it's part of the cell itself. It's not made up of many cells. The root hairs are just part of the original cell and it has the vacuole running down the middle and so that water can pass from the soil into the root hair. It then travels through the root or rootlet in this case into the xylem. Now the xylem is the tubes up the middle which carry the water. They also carry dissolved salts. However, it's not as easy as it looks because it gets from there to there, has to travel all the way through here. Running around the root is a waterproof layer dividing a layer of cells. It's called the Casparian strip. This is waterproof. So water goes from here to here. It then has to be transported using energy across the Casparian strip and into the xylem by osmosis. Very simple process, however, it uses energy up. It means that any liquid in here finds it very difficult to move back out again. And it's particularly useful in deciduous trees in the spring. So that water is actively pumped into the xylem forced up the xylem by root pressure, which forces the buds to open. So it's the pressure inside. Once, once the pressure inside has forced the leaves to open and the hormones like auxins make the leaf grow, you get transpiration, which is where the water is sucked out by evaporation. And because water is sticky, if you remember the charges on it, as one molecule of water leaves by evaporation, it sucks up another one. Round the outside of the xylem, you will find phloem. The phloem vessels carry the sugars from photosynthesis back down to the roots so that the cells actually have got a supply of sugar along with oxygen in the mitochondria, they burn it to release ATP, which is a form of energy, adenosine triphosphate, and it's a form of energy. Now, 
We prune roots to increase their surface area, but this is just a very quick calculation to show you what actually happens. If you take one root, which is 10 millimeters in diameter, or five roots, each of two millimeters in diameter, and do the surface area, which is pi r squared, you get 15.7 millimeters squared. If you take the one big plant, you get 78.6 millimeters squared. The circumference, which is pi d, gives you 31.4, exactly the same as this one, 31.4. So the ratio of this is one to a half, and this is a ratio of one to two and a half. So the fine roots are five times more efficient than the thick roots. So we've got root hairs, we've got them stuck in the soil, we've got the individual cell with its extension, water is taken in, the soil itself consists of particles which hang on to the water to a certain extent and most important at all they have air pockets now these are microscopic air pockets that is because roots are living cells and they need oxygen what happens if you leave them in water for a long time without any oxygen they die it's as simple and as easy as that. So we have waterlogged roots. So the function of the, support, the soil is to support the tree as it grows. It's absorption of water so that you get water uptake by the roots. You get adsorption, which is a charge on the clay particles, which the organic or inorganic molecules of nutrients stick to because they're ions they actually stick to the surface of it and this get, hangs on to it so instead of it every time it rains you lose all your nutrients you add which is the nutrient supply you need enough air spaces in it for it to take up oxygen so that it can respire and it also controls the ph we all know what ph is don't we it's how acid or alkali or something is it stands for the negative log of the power of the hydrogen ion concentration so most trees like a ph of between six and six and a half beet trees can tolerate it a bit higher up to about 7.8 pines like it slightly more acidic to five and a half rhododendrons particularly some of the wild ones from the himalayas can take it as low as four and 4.5 but most of the ones we deal with are between 4.8 and 5.3 because it's a log scale, a pH change of one is 10 times more hydrogen. That's the hydrogen pluses. So if you look at something that's pH one and then pH two, that's pH two is 10 times less acidic than pH one. pH three is 10 times less acidic than pH two, but 100 times less acidic than pH 1. So this goes up until you get to a pH of 7, which is neutral. It then goes into hydroxyl ions, which are OHs, which continue on up to about 14, which is very alkali indeed. Our bodies have really geared up to deal with acid, so we can drink acid quite comfortably. Most people like vinegar on their chips or Coca-Cola, phosphoric acid. We're not very good with alkali. Nobody here would like to drink bleach. Right, the stem. Now this is a section of, of stem of a, um, a common or garden tree. It consists of annular rings. So every year it grows on round. It consists of xylem. It's got vascular cambium. It's got a pericycle. Don't need to know all the details of that. What you do need to know is that the middle is made of wood. Next to the layer of wood, you have a layer of xylem. Now the xylem, as it ages every year, gets filled with lignin, which is made up of cellulose. 
the lignin builds up and it becomes woodier and woodier until it completely blocks up solid in the middle and that's the heartwood the phloem on the other hand is round the outside it's that thin layer round the outside and just the other side of that between the two are meristematic cells commonly known as cambium it's a cambium layer so you've got xylem on this side a cambium layer in the middle and then you've got a phloem on the outside just under the bark these produce the cells they're undifferentiated if they produce them on this side they become phloem if they produce them on that side they become xylem and they're meristematic which means that given the right hormones they can grow into any cell function within the tree so they can turn into branches they can turn into roots they can turn into leaves and by controlling the hormone they can actually be changed they also if you damage this area can grow bark so if you cut a branch it will grow new bark over the top we looked at the xylem of broadleaf trees now this is a section of xylem longitudinal section of xylem from a juniper unlike the straightforward tubes that you get in broadleaf angiosperms the xylem in things like juniper particularly juniper um, but there are one or two others there's, there's quite a lot in uh, pines they actually have got holes in them so the tubes have got holes in them with these bordered pits and as they become lignified they get thinner and thinner and sparser and sparser but these are very good very useful if you're a bristlecone pine or a, a san jose juniper and you have one of these and you're having a particularly rough year in other words it hasn't rained there's no water and what happens you can actually close these bordered pits if you close them the water will travel up this tube up this tube across to this tube up this tube up this tube up this tube and it can go right round the tree to the other side everything above it it will shut down and it will die but the roots at the bottom can on the right hand side can supply the roots on the left hand side which is very useful if you're doing gins and shiris unlike maples which have hardly any of these at all if you damage the roots at the bottom of a maple you will damage the branch that it feeds if you imagine these tubes here supplying the branches at the top and these here supplying the branches at the top if they get damaged in any way everything above it will die so i don't know how many people here have actually cut big roots off the bottom of maples and a branch has died that's because they're not fed whereas if it, you do it to a juniper that root will still supply the rest of the tree which is very useful as a survival strategy the other thing you will notice here is the selection of cells under here now these cells are epicormic buds they're just under the bark which is round here and if you cut the tree off these will grow if you remove the hormones further up the tree these will grow this is where we get back budding from not to be confused with adventitious buds adventitious buds are formed when the layer here that we talked about earlier which is meristematic actually produces is cut or damaged it will actually produce new buds from these cells so epicormic buds are under the bark and they are already formed there you can see them sometimes in things like limes and oaks as little tiny dimples if you peel the bark away you can actually just see them under the bark of quite large mature trees willows another one so if you if, if somebody's cut down a tree just peel the bark off and you can 
feel rather than see little nodules under the surface and you will these are the epicormic buds waiting to erupt whereas adventitious buds are the ones sometimes known as water shoots particularly on apple if you cut a branch off an apple tree it will shoot out from this meristematic tissue now we use this meristematic tissue in air layering so the idea of air layering is we cut the bark off we leave the xylem layer intact but we have removed the phloem and we have cut away the meristematic cambium layer so liquid from the roots comes up the tree here passes through the xylem because we've left that intact goes up to the leaves the leaves photosynthesize and they bring back down sugars they also bring in back down hormones the sugars and hormones come down they get to here they stop they think they're at the end of their journey so they i suppose think is the wrong word chemically they're at the end of their journey it stimulates these meristematic cells to be roots and that's how we get root formation on here to add to that we will also add indole acetic acid or indole ethanoic acid as it's now called which is a plant hormone which stimulates root growth so you can put plant hormone on here in a liquid form if you buy the powder make sure everything is dissolved before you add it because it can't take it up in a solid form it can only take it up in a liquid form right the other week i was reading an article in the bonsai magazine which was talking about symbiosis the thing is with symbiosis that is nothing more than organisms living together and there are three general types of symbiosis there's parasitic parasitic symbiosis where one organism gains everything and the other at best doesn't gain anything out at all there's a system where both of them do neither harm to each other or gain much from it but they live in close proximity within each other and then what they normally talk about in books of symbiosis is mutualism and this is particularly useful um, for conifers it helps with the mineral uptake it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere and it helps with water uptake and retention and this is the one that we normally talk about when we talk about symbiosis in trees and roots it's mycorrhiza mycorrhiza means nothing more than root fungus it can be one of a thousand or more different fungi that can either live on the surface of the root they can live within the root cells or as most of the mycorrhiza we have do a combination of both now i got this picture of a seedling and you will see that this pine seedling has got this whole area of mycorrhiza invading its small little roots which come down to about here that is just the root selection down there so these are the mycelium which spread out into the surrounding soil and take up all the nutrients that the little scots pine actually needs for it to exist and i thought that was such a lovely picture i thought you'd all like to see it why is it important well if you get too much water in your soil the fungus will die and if you don't get enough it will also die so you need to keep the water levels just right for the tree plant hormones um the commonest one we talk about are auxins they're produced in the roost tip most apical dominant trees produce their growth hormones in the tips 
um, and the auxins suppress cytokinins. Now, the cytokinins are the hormones that stimulate the epicormic buds. So if you remove the auxins, in other words, you take the tips out of your young growing trees and you stimulate the release of cytokinins and the cytokinins will then suppress the auxins, but they will generate the epicormic buds and axillary buds. And these are the ones that are in between the leaves. Gibberellins are produced by day length. And so as the days get longer, some trees start to grow more, particularly some of the Northern Hemisphere deciduous broadleaf trees. Abscisic acid breaks dormancy. That's the hormone that it suddenly decides that winter is over and it was now time to start growing again. Abscisic acid can be stimulated in several ways. Temperature stimulates it, day length stimulates it, and water, groundwater, will also stimulate it. So you get sayings like, if the oak before the ash will get a splash, and if the ash before the oak, we're in for a soak. Unfortunately, um, that's not a predictive way of doing things, but it is a good indication of what's happened in the past, because ash trees reduce their abscisic acid by the amount of water in the ground. Oak trees don't. Oak trees are entirely dependent on dalings. So their breaking dormancy depends on how much is about. Things like maples are temperature. Temperature will break their dormancy and the abscisic acid. So this is why if you go to places like Japan and Korea and go up into the mountains, when it's warm enough, all the maples come out together which is really nice, very pretty, but although they can withstand very low temperatures during the winter, the mountain maples don't like late frosts. And the reason for that is because they are temperature dependent. Unfortunately, in Britain, we tend to have nice sunny days, brings the maples on, and then it goes cold and the whole thing gets a touch of frost on the end. Ethene is a gas. If you've ever put a ripe banana in a bowl of fruit, it will send the bowl of fruit bad very quickly because it's releasing masses of ethene and the fruit ripens much too fast. But if you want to ripen some green tomatoes, put a banana in there, um, in with them, in a drawer. The ethene gas will ripen the fruit very quickly and it's produced under extreme stress. So having your fruit chopped off will release it. That's how the um, shipping companies manage to pick green bananas and ship them across to this country knowing they're going to ripen. But it, the, the stress of ethene will also inhibit growth. Photosynthesis. Now we've all We've looked at the roots. We've looked a little bit at the stems. Now we're going to go and start looking at leaves. Photosynthesis has two parts to it. There's the light dependent and the light independent. Light dependent is where the sunlight shines on the leaves and it excites the chlorophyll and it splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. The light independent process takes place 24 hours a day, usually during the night because it's not busy doing photosynthesis, and it is converting the carbon of carbon dioxide and the oxygen that's been released from the water um, into glucose, into sugar. So you've got carbon dioxide, you've got water, you end up with oxygen, which is a waste product in photosynthesis, and the glucose is given off. So if people think the rest of the, the photosynthesis only takes place when the sun is shining, they're only half right, because the other half takes place mainly at night. And you can see from this uh, GCSE question where they're asking questions what A, B, C, and D are, 
that doesn't matter too much. What is important is that it's a section through a leaf and you'll notice that the, the very outside of the leaf, whether it's a pine tree or whether it's a, a ginkgo or whether it's a um, oak leaf, is actually a very clear waterproof membrane across the top. Some it's a lot thicker on things like holly and privet, some it's quite thin, but the idea of that is it stops too much evaporation of water from the cells on the surface when they're out in full sunshine. It's clear, it's waxy, and it allows sunlight to pass through into the cells. Now the cells in the leaf contain chloroplasts, they're the site of the cell where photosynthesis takes place. Everything that's made in the photosynthesis has to be got rid of, so the sugars get transported into the phloem and travel round down the plant. The oxygen is released into a, a cavity which opens through a stomata or through stomata because that's plural of stoma into the atmosphere and you'll notice that's on the outside because that will also contain water as a gas and so it evaporates and it's evaporating the water which sucks the water up the xylem which is this one and through the cells and out glucose molecules now we looked at photosynthesis that's a simple glucose molecule on its own it's not very exciting doesn't do a lot tastes nice but that's about it but it does give massive amounts of energy because it's made of H's and OH's and O and it all splits up when it's burnt to produce carbon dioxide masses of energy if anybody has thrown a spoonful of sugar onto a fire will know what I'm talking about massive energy and carbon dioxide and water as a waste products that's why burning fossil fuels which are originally made up of glucose which have over time lost their water so you end up with if you take all the H's and all the O's off there you end up with just carbon so burning fossil fuels gives you lots of energy, but it also gives you lots of carbon dioxide. But plants actually turn these sugar molecules into all kinds of structures. What they do is they lose water. So if you take an OH off there and an H off the next one, you'll have the O that joins them together and you can join long chains. These polysaccharides form cross connections between one and another to form things like starches. They can cross link with sulfur and sulfates to, perform, to, to form lignin. And these make up the whole structure of the plant. If you take one of these long chains and add nitrogen to it, you will make a polypeptide, polypeptides, make amino acids, amino acids make proteins. I threw this one in just so that people get the idea. I have been round many places and there's always been arguments over whether you should cut pine needles to stimulate growth or whether you should pluck them. Now, if you look at five needled pines and you you look at five needled pines oh stop it Jeffrey look at five needled pines you'll notice that they have deciduous sheaths round the outside and all the new buds are on the outer edge of the needles so it means you can pluck them without damaging the new buds. So five needle pines, three needle pines, quite happily you can pluck them. 
The two needle plines have a permanent sheath and the bud is stimulated to grow from between the two leaves, the two needles which means the chances of you pulling it out when you pluck it is much, much, much harder. And the same with the three needle pines. Right? So my answer to you is I don't mind whether you pluck them or whether you clip them, but you can safely pluck these out of the five needle pines, out of the two needle pines. It's much, much harder to get it done safely the only way i've seen anybody ever do it successfully is by pulling each one of these out individually in my opinion cut them off and after a few days they drop off anyway there we are does anybody get any questions yes linda when you were talking about deciduous trees like maples and conversely pines um, when you lose a root on one side, on deciduous trees, you'll lose all the branches that depend on it. Yes. But on pines, because the, the water can move all the way round, you're fine. What about larches? All right. Larches have bordered pits but not as many as junipers. So junipers have the most, pines have some, maples have got practically none, oaks have got practically none. That's why you see staghorn oaks, because something's happened to the roots, whatever it is, and they, those branches have died, usually because they've run out of water for one reason or another, and they've actually died through lack of water. Um, or the tops have got damaged and because the tops damaged they're not supplying the roots with the nutrients so the root bit dies so they've hardly got any there are some angiosperms which have got bordered pits but none of them anywhere near as much as they've got in pines and larches have got like halfway between the two so it's more resistant to root pruning than most, but not as resistant to root pruning as junipers. Does that make sense? I wondered why I'd lost some branches off a larch. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Useful, um, to know, useful to know this year because we're working on larches. Yes. So, so um, I would treat larches like broadleaf trees because they're deciduous and they don't they have a different survival strategy to the the the, uh, the evergreen gymnosperms which are usually in conditions which are either the ground's frozen solid so they can't get moisture or that they're in desert conditions where they can't get moisture um, whereas larches are in frozen soil the same as the pines but they don't need the water because they've shut everything down and they've um, lost all their leaves so they don't have to transpire. Jeff can I ask a question? Yes. Um, it was said to uh, explain to me that when you uh, do an air layer yes. the root rooting hormone powder yes um, it doesn't actually produce roots it produces callus no. Ah. no. Right. They're half right. All right. Yeah. Now, the callusing that's on, 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 on the root is exactly the same structurally from the same meristematic cells as roots. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. So if you cut a piece of bark, it wants to repair it with bark. Yeah. That's its natural. The rooting hormone will then change the mechanism by the way the meristematic cambium reproduces so it thinks it is a root and not a bark. Right, gotcha. So it changes the callus 
into roots. Uh -huh. But it's entirely hormonal. Putting rooting powder on as powder yeah. doesn't do anything. So you recommend if you're going to do air layers, use the liquid uh, rooting hormone. Or take ordinary, ordinary rooting powder. And mix and it with water. Yeah. Mix it with, with water and make a liquid paste, you know, yeah. and you can still paint it on, but yeah. turn it into a, you know, an emulsion or a, a liquid. It. Yeah. So, so yeah. And, and mo most of the time, by putting it on as just powder, you're not doing anything, but the tree will just callous. And you okay. don't want it to callous. No, no, I understand. So when somebody says, oh, it only produces callus, not roots, yeah. they're probably, you know, half right. Um, what they're doing is they're not actually using the indole acetic acid as a hormone. They're just putting white powder on it. <laughs> right. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Does it... Anyone else? Anything? Yeah, Jeff, on the air layering still. Yeah. Um, so... When you cut into when when you do a traditional air layering, yeah, and you've you have a problem with you say you've gone too deep and you've gone through the xylem, so yeah. which is this a system this system I'm trying at the moment where you remove it totally from the mother plant straight away. So you're you're making a cutting, right? Yeah. Now the the roots received the, the the water through the humidity through the leaves yeah they can actually take the water up through the xylem that's on the cut part of the tree right or, or the cutting so it, so 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 it will take up water doesn't matter i mean if you cut the xylem that's exactly the same as at the end by the roots it's a tube. It's nothing more than a tube. It's dead. It's got no living structure to do it. Is you can you can take a plant, you can take the xylem out, you can put a piece of glass tube in back, stick the tin in, and the water will still be sucked up the tube. Right. So if you've got liquid water round the xylem that's been taken out too far. It will suck it up. Putting water on the leaves, the tree will not take up much water from its leaf. It will take up a little, but it won't take much. But putting water on the leaves stops the rate of transpiration so that it doesn't use as much water and doesn't dehydrate. So is so, it beneficial if you are doing a traditional air layer to bag the foliage at the top? So that no, no, no advantage whatsoever. If you're doing a traditional era, none whatsoever. That's only if you've got, I would suggest you bag the foliage at the top if you have cut off too much xylem. Right. So if you've gone too deep into the heartwood rather than just under the bark. You would then? You would then, yes. Right. You know you've done it wrong because the, the xylem oozes out of everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Basically, you're, you're just treating it like a cutting. You're just treating it like a cutting, yes. Which we put we put in plastic anyway. Yes. Or, you know, contain it on somehow to keep the yeah. moisture around, the, keep it humid. Yes. So, Jeff, just thinking yes. about um, saying the leaves don't take a lot of moisture in from um, wetting the leaves. Um, how does foliar feeding work if they don't take up right. much? Okay. If you think about it, most of a leaf is waterproof. Yeah? Most of the leaf is yeah. waterproof. If you use a foliar feed, it's usually in something which is, allows it to pass into the cells. Right. As opposed to just splashing water on the top, which will just sit there as droplets of water so right, something in it to get it across the membrane it, it just needs something to get it across a, um, and that can be in the form of a salt um, right, gotcha. 
or it can be in the form of a um, an organic compound, which is readily uh, taken up through. But yes, getting it, it foliar feeds are generally a um, lot less in lot less inefficient, lot less yes lots lot less, less efficient than root feeding yeah no i appreciate that uh, no, but, but obviously i i do uh, liquid seaweed foliar feeding on things like the junipers and pines and it really i think it really helps to bring yeah. out color but you're not adding nitrates phosphates and things you're putting seaweed in seaweed contains things like um um gums and oils, um, and, and, and I mean, these are all good things. I'm not saying they're not, but, right. yeah. but, that, but then, and, 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 and it also means that you're removing the dust and the dirt from the surface of the leaf. So that allows more sunlight to get through into the, I mean, ah, anybody, okay. anybody who keeps <laughs> a rubber plant, they wipe all the leaves, don't they? Continue yeah. the dust off and all the things. And the oils that are in those surface feeds will actually stimulate the waxy finish to, to let more sunlight through. So, right. yes, carry on doing it, uh -huh. but you'll probably find what falls on the soil, as much of that gets in through the roots as gets in through the leaves. So, so, so yes, it works. Yes, it's right. But you can't just feed ordinary fertiliser. Oh, no, no, I don't. It's, it's yeah. a supplementary. Yes. It's just a supplementary, yeah. But it's got to be a some specific foliar feed that has got something to carry it across the, the membranes. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, I'm with it. OK, thank you. I think I've understood some of this evening. You should be able to understand more than some of it. If well, I've gone, gone too fast, I'm not expecting you to remember it. I'm just trying to help you, uh, trying to explain why doing some of the things we do in bonsai works and why we shouldn't do some of the things we're told to do because it's actually wrong. Yes. Yeah. No, that made I mean, sense, all of that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that was quite commonly going around, you should never um, spray maples on a hot summer's day because the water droplets sitting on the leaves would magnify the sun's rays and burn the leaves. A load of bunkum. You haven't got enough distance to, to focus the lens of the sunbeam. Not only of that, as the water evaporates, you get latent heat of evaporation and it cools the leaves down. So it's <laughs> beneficial to it. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's absolutely balmy sometimes, the things you hear sometimes. Um, and another one is about pruning maples. I mean, maples, um, uh, particularly things like sugar maples, but the mountain maples are designed to be in temperatures of minus 40 during the winter. You know, they don't need protection. They can stand the cold. Not so good with the wet, but they can stand the cold. Um, but the worst thing you want to do is prune them when it's like that, because yeah. they pump sugar into all their vessels and tubes and cells, which acts as an antifreeze, you know. And that's using lots of energy. It uses active transport to move it in because they have no leaves on the surface. So they're pumping it into all the twigs and twiglets. And you go along and cut it off. So what's it going to do? It's just going to spew out sugar. Well, it's a good job if you like maple syrup because yeah. that's what you get it. Yeah. So there are lots of things that, that happen and, and go. On. And the one I like, really do like, is tipping your pots up for drainage. Is that something to do with the perching water table within the pot? Yes, exactly to do with it. If you tip it up in the winter and it's raining, a third of the pot will then fill up with water. Yeah. Whereas if you've got good drainage in the soil, it just runs out. Yeah. Does that mean then that in the winter you should keep your maples slightly on the drier side? Yes. Slightly on the drier side, but don't mollycoddle them and bring them indoors. They, 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 they're much better off being frozen solid. <laughs> yeah, they don't like being waterlogged. And when I say maples, I mean the, 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 
the very hardy mountain, you know, the uh, the palmatons and the uh, japonicas, those maples, yeah, as well as the uh, sacrum. I've forgotten it. Linda will tell me. Sacrum, what is it, Linda? Sugar maple? Perinum. Well, I just wanted to say that that was actually very useful, although I didn't grasp all of it. There were bits of it that made quite a lot of sense. So um, I'm certainly not into science, but I was grasping bits of it as we were going well, along. Yeah. I mean, if everybody, learned, if everybody comes away knowing more than they did when they started, it's been worth doing, isn't it? Yeah. I Thank found you. it very interesting. Um, and it confirmed um, a number of uh, things that I had in my head. And, and the reasons for it. So thank yeah, you. I mean, most of what we do with bonsai is absolutely right because we we we're told that's what to do, and they've been doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years, and all the other things have gone wrong. It's just that sometimes the stories behind why we do it are wrong. Not yeah. what we do is wrong, but the stories uh -huh. behind it are wrong, and sometimes they they do get the story twisted round, and you go it goes pear shaped. But uh, I remember sitting in one um, lecture by a guy who stood up and was talking about anions and what was going on and what he really meant were cations. And I don't like it when they get it wrong. <laughs> and Peter, who was president of our club, jabbed me in the elbows and said, shut up, Jeff, don't start arguing. <laughs> yes. I found it very interesting as well about the ash and the oak and the maple being dependent on different things. To, to, to go into leaf, to leaf break, yeah. yes. Are there any other examples of trees you've got that are dependent on different things? Uh, uh, all trees depend on the, one of those three things. Some are totally dependent on one of them, some are dependent on two, and some need all three. Right. Um, it, it just depends what part of the world they come from and what kind of climate conditions they, they've evolved to be in. So you can't say all maples are like this and you can't say all oaks are like this because some oaks live in conditions where they don't even lose their leaves. I mean, you think of things like home oaks and mm. holly oaks, they're, they're completely different to our oak, but they're still oaks. Yeah, um, so, so they, they do, they have evolved from these three things, but it's just that it's an old wives tale that everybody knows, which is nearly right. It's not what's going to happen, it's what's happened already. So like the ash coming out earlier this year was because it was a very wet year. Yes, Yeah. but the oak will come out when the day length is the right length every time, whether it's cold or it's hot, and you'll find that it comes out quite a lot later than most other trees if we've got a nice warm spring, because things like hawthorn and slow are temperature dependent. They will just come out, so if they think it's nice enough to come into leaf, they will come into leaf or flower first, as in case of slow. Yeah, so, so they stimulate the bud burst and it, it, it makes no difference. Whereas things like hornbeam are temperature and light dependent. So it doesn't matter how much day length there is, if it's not warm enough, they won't come into leaf. But if it's warm enough and it, the days aren't long enough, it still won't come into leaf. And that is re reflected this year. My hornbeam was nearly as late as my oak this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Had such a long cold spring. Yeah. But it can be a lot earlier. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Jeff, please. There's uh, doing the rounds of the bonsai. I notice at the moment is there's a lot of talk about uh, yamadori and uh, and when you're uh, potting up uh, uh, trees that you dug up and black bagging them. What's the science there behind the the black bagging? I don't know. I don't understand it at all. No. The only thing I can think of is it's something similar to um, when you're forcing rhubarb. Because you put rhubarb in and it forces it to grow quicker, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So because it, yeah, it's temperature dependent, rhubarb. Yeah. It's not light dependent. But if you had a light dependent tree, it wouldn't work. 
putting them in black. I can see that the, putting them in the black will warm them up quicker because it absorbs more energy. Would it but be something to, do, something to do with um, keeping the humidity within the bag as well? So. But a clear plastic bag would do that. Yeah, no. Perhaps it work, would work with a clear plastic bag. Yeah, I don't know. I, I understand the putting things in plastic bags, but I don't understand the logic behind black plastic bags. Would that not be to do with the day length? Yes, but if you, if, if you, but that only works if the tree is a day length tree. Hmm. If it's a temperature dependent tree, it won't work. Or it might do because it's getting warmer. But if it's a say, it would do because it's generating a lot more warmth, especially if yeah. the bag is left in in well, warm sun or something like that. If, yeah, but if you're collecting trees from the wild, why do you want the root? Why do you want the tops to come into leaf early? I would have thought you'd have wanted the roots to start growing because roots start growing about a month before the before the leaves do. Yeah, that's that's why we we root prune when the buds start beginning to burst because we the roots have actually developed their their um. Uh, root hairs for that year we cut them off when we're doing so we don't need the energy from the uh, Casparian strip to pump the xylem across to pump the leaves out because they've already started moving already yeah. so that's why we do it then um, it, otherwise you do it in the autumn and then it's got a chance of the warmer weather that we sometimes get in February and March before the leaves come out for the roots to actually regenerate and grow well, there's a, there's a number of trees that, um, or a number of bonsai professionals that do repot in the autumn now, or mm, sort of late yeah. August, in the midsummer pause, if you like. Yeah. As long as you can provide the, the care afterwards, isn't it? Yeah. They, they, they'll get four months more root growth. Yeah. Rather than repotting in the spring. Yeah. Oh. And, then, and, uh, and when you think professionally, orchards were always planted in the autumn. Yeah, yeah. Well, you still, still typically now, if you buy a tree from you know, a, um, a specialist nursery, it'll recommend to plant it in the autumn, won't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so did this black bag business, I, I don't actually understand. I can understand putting the roots in a black plastic bag because that keeps them warm, it keeps them moist, it keeps them, you know, they're well, not typically gonna... when they black. Uh, certainly with um, Harry Harrington, when he black bags, he, he puts the whole thing in a black bag. You know, pot and everything. He yeah. doesn't put the bag I, over the top. I've just looked at Harry's site and he, he explains it, that it creates greater humidity around the tree yeah. to help it form new budding, but it also holds the budding back while the tree is putting out its new roots. Right. Well, that makes sense then, doesn't it? Yeah, but that's what I said. I didn't know. I did. I, I, I didn't know. But that'll only work on light-dependent trees. Yeah. And you also put it in the willow water though before you black bag it, so that's going to let the hormones work as well, isn't it? That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's so much hormone in willow bark that it's <laughs> just amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I'm, I'm just, I, Is that, Jeff, would that be all willows? That's all willows, yes. Yeah. 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 Salicylic acid. You Bottle call of it, aspirin. Yeah, you call it yeah. <laughs> aspirin. But, but indolacetic acid and salicylic acid are chemically very similar to each other. Because I had some Chinese elm cuttings. I didn't have time to hot up straight away so I dropped them in some willow water and I forgot about them until three days later they had like a gel formed around the base so I presume that's hormonal is it that yes. gel? yeah so yes. did I need to add hormone no, rooting no, powder or gel no, as well no 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 no, no not at all not yeah, at all quite, it was quite incredible to see so yeah do the same with aspirin it's the, it's the same effect with aspirin yeah, well, from, that's, from. yeah. I mean, aspirin is just a modified salicylic acid. Chemically, it's very similar. In fact, they they make salicylic acid first before they process it to make aspirin. Yeah, 
synthetic aspirin as opposed to naturally occurring aspirin. But, but I, I remember many years ago, um, somebody did an experiment with willow, which was just amazing. They, they, they took a, a willow, a weeping willow um, piece of branch about four inches in diameter, stuck it in a bucket of water, let it grow roots. It then grew sh shoots out of the top and then the following spring, they cut all the shoots off back to about four inches long, turned the tree upside down and planted it back in the ground and the roots started growing leaves. <laughs> um, absolutely unbelievable. And that was to do with the fact that there is so much growth hormone in willow that it just grows anything anywhere. And the, the, when it got turned up the other way, it just... Um, started growing like that. I, I've, ne I've never had tried it. I ought to try it one day and just see if it is actually true or whether it's one of these stories that I got passed on to. So by that reckoning, if you um, added willow water to sort of any sphagnum moss, if you were doing air layers, it would certainly... It, 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 absolutely. You wouldn't need to put any rooting hormone on. Oh, absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. In fact, if, you, if you've got rooting hormone, I would make up a solution in a bucket and soak all the sphagnum moss in it and wrap that round. That's the way I do it. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, thank uh, that. That's a good tip. Thank you. Yeah, rather than put the powder on the thing. Well, I, I typically make it into a paste, but it, in, it inevitably runs down the trunk. And... Yeah, so I soak the sphagnum moss in it and put the sphagnum oh, okay. moss around. Yeah, I think we've finished. Jeff, on behalf of all of us, thank you for doing this tonight. Thank you for listening.